Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Quinn, Director of Wilfrid Laurier University Press. It is my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the launch of The Queer Evangelist, A Socialist Clergy's Radically Honest Tale. As we gather here virtually, I acknowledge that my home and the press offices are located on the traditional territory of the Adirondan, or neutral peoples, the Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee on the Haldeman Tract, which runs six miles on either side of the Grand River. We express our gratitude to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. A few housekeeping items before we begin our program. If you have a technical question, please enter it into the Q&A and we will do our best to resolve any issues as they arise. As well, throughout the reading and conversation, please put your questions for Sherry in the Q&A and we will address as many of those as possible later in the evening. We are thrilled to be partnering for this event with another story bookshop in Toronto who have signed copies of The Queer Evangelist available. There is a link in the chat to order your copy. Ebook versions are available as well from your preferred vendor. Author Sherry DeNovo grew up in Toronto in a rooming house owned by her parents and spent time on the streets as a teenager, leading her to social activism. In 2001, she performed the first legalized same-sex marriage in Canada, and as a member of the Ontario Legislative Assembly, she passed into law more pro-LGBTQ plus legislation than anyone in Canadian history. She is currently minister at Trinity St. Paul's Centre for Faith, Justice, and the Arts. She has won numerous awards for her activism and was named a member of the Order of Canada in 2019 for her contributions to provincial politics and advocacy for social justice. El Faru Kaki is an intersectional human rights and dignity activist, public speaker, writer, author, and media commentator on Islam, LGBTIQ and human rights, refugees, politics, racism, HIV, and queer parenting. Al Farouk is the founder of Salam, queer Muslim community, and co-founder and imam of El Tahid Juma Circle, the Unity Mosque. He is ordained as a reverend and officiates marriages for all orientations, genders, and faiths. He is a lawyer whose practice focuses on refugee claims based on sexual orientation, gender, gender identity and expression, and HIV. He is a co-owner of the Glad Day Bookstore, the world's old oldest LGBTIQ bookstore. He is currently working on a book exploring Islam, intersectional identities, global issues, sexuality, refugees, social justice, and spirituality. Before handing the program to Sherry to start us with a selected reading from the book, it is my privilege to welcome MPP Kathleen Wynne, who was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2003 as the MPP for Don Valley West. She was Ontario's 25th Premier and leader of the Ontario Liberal Party from January 2013 to June 2018. MPP Wynne has dedicated her professional life to building a better province for the people of Ontario. She is guided by the values and principles that knit this province together fairness, diversity, collaboration, and creativity. We're so pleased she joined us today to bring her greetings. MPP Wen. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much. And I want to just say to everybody who has joined, thank you very much for being here. Um, to Sherry and Al Farouk, it's great to see you. And um, I was thrilled to be asked to come and uh, say a few words. I was also thrilled to be asked to write a foreword to The Queer Evangelist. Um, it's a real honor, um, not, that, not one that I would have expected, but I, um, I was absolutely honored to do it. And, you know, I, um, I didn't know Sherry at all until she was elected to uh, Queen's Park in September 2006, uh, at the same time that I was appointed Minister of Education. And from the moment she arrived, Sherry put us, put me on the spot. She was, um, she was always a truth teller and her questions to government were always a huge challenge, but that's the best, that's the best kind of questions from opposition. The thing about Sherry that was um, so terrific uh, as a colleague was that she reached across the floor. She would, we would talk about issues. I went on her radio show at uh, U of T. Um, we shared concerns. And, um, and you know, in, in working with Sherry, it was so clear 
uh, why she was in this business. Um, it turned out when I read the book, I discovered that she and I were baptized in the same church, Richmond Hill United. I, when I was a toddler in the 50s, and Sherry later on when she, uh, when she decided that the United Church was where she wanted to act out her faith and her activism. Um, I am so glad that Sherry wrote this book. It's a really important book. It's an important book because she talks about the political process and the work that she has done. But it's an important book because she's a strong, brilliant woman who tells her story and talks about how she didn't unravel in the, uh, the circumstances that for many of us would have been so challenging so um, and would have caused us to throw up our hands. So Sherry, thank you for writing this book. Uh, I think it will be I think it will be read over and over and it will be so helpful to uh, to people in all walks of life, but particularly people who are trying to merge their faith, their activism and their politics. So thank you and I'm going to throw to you all the best. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Elfruk. I was thinking as I uh, contemplated tonight that, you know, here we have an imam and clergy walking into a bookstore. So it starts at the, like the beginning of a joke. And Kathleen, uh, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, we had lots of fun uh, when I was in the legislature and, and, you know, many prayers surround you and everyone in opposition now because of what you have to face. Um, I also want to give some shout outs to uh, some folk who are here who really played such important roles in my life. Um, first of all, uh, Judy Rebick from Rabble. Uh, we all know Judy and thank you for your contributions to everything. Um, Sandy Hudson, who, uh, Sandy, thank you so much for the beautiful blurb that you wrote on the book. And thank you for being the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada. Um, Arash Azizi uh, from New York, thank you for joining us. And Sandy from LA. Um, Arash is the author of The Shadow Commander, great book. Please do read it as well. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our political representatives that are here. Uh, Kathleen, of course, Butila Karpoche, who I worked with for eight years and who now represents us so well in Park Hill High Park. Merritt Stiles in Davenport. Nikki Ashton, MP. Um, thank you, Nikki, for being here. Uh, Peggy Nash, uh, again, mentor. Uh, Rima Burns McGowan, thank you, Rima, for being here. Uh, Norm de Pasquale, uh, trustee for the TDS, uh, TCDSB. Alex Grant from Fight Back, and, and then all these incredible women who are in the book. Christy Mathers McHenry, um, uh, one of the uh, lawyers behind the Parent Equality Act. Uh, Fran Coughlin, uh, Jody Fisher, Susan Gapka, great Susan Gapka, uh, one of the best lobbyists ever for queer bills and queer rights. Chris Smaller, um, Elaine Fliss, Fees of Mir, uh, Andrea Houston, um, Babs and Robin, and of course my family members, and uh, my family of faith at Trinity St. Paul Center for Faith, Justice and the Arts. So welcome to you all and thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to, it's great to uh, have you. Um, and now I'm gonna read, and this is from, it's, it's just a little excerpt from a chapter that is called Teenage Trotskyist, or I, if you wanna make the movie version, I was a teenage Trotskyist. Uh, so I'll just start in. Socialism has, had always been in the air at my home. My father was an almost full-time volunteer for our Labour Party, first the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, then the newly formed New Democratic Party because the CCF made people think communist. I had canvassed with him as a kid and held protest signs when George Wallace, a racist Southern governor, came to town. Graham and I shoved Conservative Party flyers down an apartment's incinerator because dad said, that's what you did, it was necessary. I learned early what was meant by political expediency. Even as a teenager, though, I knew that social democracy wasn't enough. The great social democracies, which were admittedly way, way more livable than North America, still offshored their sketchy labor practices, and they were still capitalist. I believed we needed true socialism, where the larger industries and companies were under community control. The USSR, still alive and well, was clearly an aberration, rather than the socialism it pretended to be. It was just another totalitarian country. That's why one Friday night, when they held their forums on various topics, I went to their meeting, the Trotskyists that is, I made quite an entrance. You see, I was only months free from my acid queen era and I didn't have a clue about the left's dress code. 
I sported platform shoes that added about six inches to my height. Also, I wore a sequin jumpsuit over a body stocking that made it look like I was naked underneath, plus two pairs of fake eyelashes and a black fall, kind of a wiglet, a fake hair piece that was popular then. I'd been dyeing my hair jet black for some time. I was a sight. I'm sure they thought I was a drag queen, which I would have taken as the ultimate compliment. It was pretty clear, pretty fast, that I didn't fit in. Everyone was wearing jeans, nondescript shirts or t-shirts with slogans and Birkenstocks or runners, still the classic left garb. Obviously we didn't frequent the same places. I lived at the queer clubs where I would have fit right in. They hung out at pubs where the beer was cheap. They were welcoming, however, from the first, they generously accepted this weird queer new person and invited me along for beers. We learned to be evangelists in the sense of recruiting others to the good news of socialism. And for that, it was always about growth. I learned to sell papers. I was among the best. I learned to infiltrate the NDP to try to move it to the left. One NDP writing association meeting I attended found me and my father in the same room. My father spent all his time at the mic calling for the expulsion of all Trotskyists. Hilarious, I was truly undercover. I worked on the youth group's newspaper and the Velvet Fist, a new feminist journal we women invented. One of the co-editors was Alice Klein, later publisher and originator of Now in Toronto. Much later, we learned that the RCMP had an agent working on the paper with us. We couldn't have cared less, even back then. We had nothing to hide, and quite frankly, the more help getting it out, the better. It was a supremely practical movement, practical and yet, of its time, misogynist, homophobic, and racist. We women were told that when we protested a beauty pageant, we should wear dresses, less the press think we were dykes. That word again. A young comrade was informed that because he was Jewish, he should go to law school. The movement needed a lawyer. One of my friends, a very feminine Black Asian gay boy, was told his outfits were too bourgeois, too girly. Such were the times. Of course, we women objected. We queers spoke up. Yet we were informed that the revolution was bigger than any of us and that identity politics should fall in behind class struggles, as if we weren't part of the class struggle, as if the majority of queers and women aren't working class. I and the others fell in, however, we adapted. At one point, they sent me to New York to liaise with comrades there. I ended up staying for almost two years and that time proved awesome. Their demonstrations brought out tens of thousands of supporters where ours were just thousands. There the Trotskyist left was composed of many competing factions. What do you get with three Trotskyists in a room? The joke went, three political parties and a faction. New York was excitement. The queer scene was huge. Women's clubs held hundreds of half-naked dancing women. Men with beards and long hair wore dresses. It was called radical drag. Returning home to Toronto brought into focus how much was wrong in my life with two real turning points. First, when it became apparent that I was queer and proud of it. The other comrade women in my commune accused me of being male identified because I had a girlfriend. Second, the logic of the movement sometimes escaped me. If revolution was inevitable, then why did we all have to work so hard at making it happen? Naively, I asked my comrades that question over beers one night. The answer, because that way, when it happens, we'll be at the vanguard of the change. Don't you want to be a leader in the new world? I was silent, but it occurred to me that argument didn't explain the sad end of Trotsky our patron saint. Then I remembered what Mao said, the revolution is not a tea party, no doubt. But my cynicism returned. Speaking of Mao, however, I can't leave my Trotskyist time without mentioning the Maoists in Toronto. This is in the 70s, remember. They were mainly the rich offspring of true bourgeois and absolutely all white at the time. I met one of them putting up posters I asked how they expected Chinese immigrants to read them if all the posters were in English. The young blonde Maoist replied, 
the language of the proletariat is universal, to which I say, amen. So El Farouk, come and join me, we'll have a conversation. And by the way, you know, uh, apologies to all the Marxists in the crowd tonight that I genuinely <laughs> love and ring with, but it was a time, right? El Farouk, welcome. Hey, <laughs> I was laughing my way through it with glimmers of recognition and um, nodding my head and going, yep, I, I understand and I, I relate to so much of what was in that in that uh, short reading. Well, you the first time I, I saw you on the campaign trail, you were wearing a purple velvet suit. So <laughs> so we're cut from the same sort of cloth there, El Farouk. And, and by the way, just to add to Lisa's introduction to El Farouk, I first met him, I think it was like 20 years ago because at my church back then, now Roncesvalles United, um, we hosted Salam Queer Muslim and that was that was the time, right? I'll tell you when it was. I met you in 2002 oh. and uh, I met you on a panel for Trembling Before God, which was a documentary done by Sandy Dabowski on uh, Orthodox and Hasidic lesbian and gay Jews. And uh, they'd organized a number of sort of uh, town hall panels and so on. And they'd wanted to hold one on interf uh, an interfaith panel. And I had sort of moved away a lot from public activism on, on LGBT more uh, Muslim issues during that time. Um, and I was talked into doing this panel. Um, and it was on that panel that I met you. And you were hosting the a vigil for the first anniversary of 9-11 and you invited me to be part of that uh part of that vigil so um that's how that that dance began that was in 2002 so 19 years close to 20 yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so you had some questions ask away what do you want to know well um, you know i what i'm i i'm not sure whether i have so many uh, so many questions as i do sort of the 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 spring points so one of the things that that is really profound for me is you know even on your cover on your cover page you've got a socialist clergy uh and you identify as being socialist because i think right now we're at a um at a point in in our society's cultural and political development where religiosity is seen as something socially and economically conservative so people who are on the right wing tend to be, and I just want you to sort of comment a little bit about about that sort of whether you've had to deal with that in in your in your circles, and certainly we see the Christian right and we see the the fundamentalist this, and these are all tend to be right wing, and so so the the claiming of space as a person not only as a person of faith but as as clergy um, and claiming that on the left as a vehicle for liberation and justice is something that is a little bit outside of the uh, dominant narrative these days. Maybe you can comment on that. Sure. Thanks, El Farouk. Um, well, right, right off the bat, a shout out to uh, last year, we started a conference called The Christian Left, which, uh, and I know, I think Michelle Voss Roberts is here tonight too from Emmanuel College, and she was one of the movers and shakers that uh, got that going, which was wonderful. Um, and, uh, and it's coming back again this year. Uh, and in particular to answer that question that first of all, there is such a thing as the Christian left uh, over and against the Christian right. I've often said hashtag the Christian right is neither, um, but you know, that's, it's really important. And I think the, the struggle is the same El Farouk in the Muslim world as it, is it in the Christian world, which is not to throw out the holy, the holy book, but to actually read it and to actually you know, do some exegesis and explicate it, like actually talk about what's in there and why it's, it's so important and why it doesn't belong with a right-wing ideology. Um, and so to use the book against you know, those who would use the book um, to harm folk, especially queer folk, right? But also others. Um, and so that, that's, I think, the task. And it's, you know, it is truly a task. Um, it's the one I see myself focused on. So when I, when I named the book, The Queer Evangelist, um, you know, uh, it's really about that. Uh, my first book was called, the, you know, Queering Evangelism, in which I argue that evangelism isn't about us in the church going out and, you know, being imperialists and, you know, colonialists and beating people over the head and killing them. No, it's about welcoming them in to evangelize us 
that we are in fact the object, not the subject of evangelism and that we need the margins to speak at us, to, to teach us and show us what the scriptures uh, talk about. And so that was my doctoral thesis. Um, but I mean, it, it, things haven't changed since then. Uh, and it, it's still a struggle. Um, and particularly now, uh, you know, it seems even more of a struggle. And in terms of socialism, you know, it's always, I've always considered myself on the left of the NDP, um, still do. And, um, and I think again, um, I, I see my role there um, in my involvement, I've taken some years away from it, but is to absolutely keep the word socialism alive and what it means. That's, uh, if I can sort of riff on that, and this mm -hmm. is also part of um, our intertwined journeys, right? Because we've got the clergy and theology issues, and then we've also got the political issues that, that, that intertwine us. And I just wanted to comment that, you know, when I, when I came to your church and then I attended the, the Seder that you used to host and the, and the vigil, and the Seder was, became the inspiration for how we share the, the Ramadan iftar with a wider community of folks and, and, and so on. So bringing the margins into the center and shifting the paradigm is uh, theologically uh, has become a very important part of, of my theology and, 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 and my narrative. And I, and I did see that at play um, when you were minister at, 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 at Howard Emanuel Park. I wanted to, to move on to the issue of being a politician and being clergy because you know the 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 dance between politics and religion um is kind of toxic uh when 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 religion has entered uh when there has been no separation of of church or mosque or temple or whatever and and state i, I don't care what the theology is but there's a there's a toxicity there but um You've been your clergy. You've been in 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 Parliament. Uh, in your book, you talk about how you were craving being back in in the in in the church and 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 ministering. I ran. I didn't get elected, and I now sit and I sort of wonder. You know, do I ever want to be elected? Um, do you think? Where do you think? So I guess my question really is: Where are you most fulfilled? Uh, and is the political arena actually um, an arena where transformation is possible, assuming that transformation is, is possible in the theological or in the spiritual arena? Um, great question. So, uh, so first of all, to the political arena, and thank you to all of the politicians who are in our midst tonight. <laughs> um, thank you for what you do, because one of the things I hope to do in the book is talk about how difficult it is you know, how there's no such thing as a lazy politician, how we work constantly, right? Um, so, so I mean, I wanted to, to, to show that. But also um, this, this dance between reform and revolution is the dance I talk about a lot in the book. Mm. I think uh, it's, it's implicit, if not explicit. And that is, you know, on the, on the, on the left, you know, sometimes it's the too perfect left that says, oh, don't be involved, you know, the, the game's rigged. Well of, well, of course it is. I mean, you know, multinationals throw money around and that affects policy, of course it does. And not even multinationals, our own, uh, our own wealthy here do a pretty good job of it too. Um, so there is that, but you can still save lives. I always come back to that. You can still save lives. Uh, you don't have to choose between reform and revolution. I mean, I think of the bills um, that I managed to get, you know, put into law. And again, I, you know, I'm working across the aisle with people like Kathleen to do that. But I mean, banning conversion therapy, we banned it for, for minors in 2015 in Ontario. Um, uh, you know, that saves lives. Putting trans rights, thank you, Susan Kapka. I mean, putting trans rights into the human rights code uh, and named after the music director at my church, Toby Dancer, who was trans. Uh, th this kind of action saves lives, the ramification of it. And you know, as a lawyer, Elfrook, that you know laws either hurt people or they help people. Um, and of course, there's they, they're just the beginning. Then you have to put them into place. You have to enact them. You have to you know do the education around them. So there's still a long way to go on both those fronts. But I mean, there's still so important. And, you know, parent equality, which was originally called Cy and Ruby's law, 
Um, thank you, Christy, who's here tonight, um, one of the lawyers who worked on that. I mean, you know, women and trans folk had to adopt their own babies until that law became, until that bill became law. So, so again, these are all bills that actually make a huge difference in the lives of individuals. And, um, and, and so do it, absolutely. I mean, we have made, uh, we women and we, you know, and we queer folk, we LGBTQ2S, uh, uh, IA folk, we have made significant strides and those strides make it safer to just live. And, and that's so important, but yes, um, is it enough? No, it's not enough. It's not enough to save the planet. We see the environmental challenges that, that you know, capitalism unrestrained um, brings about. Um, and no, it's not enough when you know the the inequality is rife, and where the poorest are getting poorer, the middle class is emptying out, and the wealthier getting wealthier. It's not enough when all, you know injustice happens everywhere we look. So, so, I, but you can do both. So I always say, especially to BIPOC people, especially to queer folk, especially to women, get in there. You know, get elected, do what you can do, and you can do quite a lot. And also, you know, understand how the game's played, understand that this is not a place where ultimately we are going to be able to, unless it changes dramatically, and, and uh, unless it changes dramatically, we are not going to be able to save the earth based on the current economic system. So ending on a downer note there. <laughs> well, maybe it's a downer note, but I mean, surely the path of, of faith is the path of transformation. So um, how do we get there? How, how do we evangelize our way to saving the planet? So the quote is pr probably apropos now, right behind me, every revolution seems impossible until it happens. Um, and uh, you and I are of an age that we've seen a couple of those revolutions. I mean, the, you know, happen uh, on, on this planet and they were considered impossible. I thought, I never thought the Soviet Union would end without a nuclear holocaust as a kid. Um, it crumbled. Um, uh, and you know what's replaced it is, isn't great, but um, but let let's say that was a phenomenal change, phenomenal political change that we really didn't think was going to happen without a war. So huge things can happen and do happen, and I think they will happen. I'm an optimist. Um, I think you know what was you know you know even when I talk about thousands on the left in New York City, and there were um, and it was exciting. I mean. Progress International. I mean, there are huge movements globally. There are huge movements, um, even in our own country, um, to to match the growth of the right. And I think they just need a voice. And uh, and that. Um, so I, I, I look forward to a better tomorrow as well. And I want to acknowledge, like, as you have some of the amazing folks that are even with us today. And I see uh, Rima is here from the provincial legislature. Religion and spirituality. I, I often, when I'm speaking, I always say that I think religion without spirituality is toxic. Uh, because it, it reduces uh, a relationship with the divine to a list of do's and don'ts. I'm wondering whether you have any thoughts, and that's one question. And my second question that's not connected to this at all is how did you come up with dividing your book into the kind of chapters and, and this kind of scheme? So that's, that's two different... Sure. I mean, it's basically um, divided up in terms of, you know, the times of my life. So it goes from being little to being big, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so that was the the division. Uh, and uh, I, I think the hope of the book is to give hope, to give hope to street kids, queer kids, to give hope to, uh, a, you know, folk who are wrestling with addiction, to give hope to, to folk that have uh, trauma in their backgrounds, to give hope to people who are engaged in politics and activism, um, to give them all hope. And, um, and to your question about spirituality, of course, I mean, this is, this is why people end up, I think, looking uh, for faith and looking, walking into places that 
that possibly we never thought we'd walk into. Certainly, I never thought I would walk into a church that was raised as an atheist. Um, and why? Because you recognize that, especially in the political world, you're beating your head against a wall often, and sometimes the head gives and the wall does not. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like I always say to activists, don't worry, we'll win. But I, you know, the only question is when. Well, when might be when we're long dead, right? So how do you keep going? Like what keeps you, you know, taking one foot, you know, to one step in front of the other? What keeps you doing that? And I realized in political life, there wasn't a lot, you know? I mean, if it's all just about getting reelected or just even if it's just getting a bill passed, like where are you getting your sustenance from? So that's why faith and faith, uh, faith at its best. And I think, you know, your place of faith, my place of faith, I think faith places at their best are really alternative communities to the larger world in which we find ourselves. There are communities where the real task is to learn to love each other. Um, I mean, try saying that in the legislature, you know, the real task in a faith place is to learn to love each other. We might not like each other, but we have to learn to love each other. That is the call upon us from the divine, right? So, so that learning to love one another is the greatest spiritual ask and the greatest spiritual path. And only in a faith co community where you're up against real difference, I mean, real difference, political difference, all sorts of difference, um, but you all come together to do that one thing and to explore your own spirituality, right? So this is a kind of beautiful alternative community from which that gives you the kind of sustenance and hope that then sends you out into the world to be able to to do the rest of it, um, and and that loving that learning to love each other that yeah we'll never master it, but I mean it's the journey right it's the journey. Yes, it's always the journey, not the destination, right? Because the destination is always somehow at the end of that very long tunnel. So, um, so those are the questions that I had sort of. Uh, ruminated over and sort of picked out as I as I thought were were relevant at least to my to my reading and to my relationship with you um I'm open to I don't know what comes next it's yeah well we can so certainly just a reminder to everybody you can um just like a, a, on a regular zoom call you can put your your questions your comments in chat um uh it, or whatever it looks like it's a new platform for me too um and we will see them there so um and maya uh thank you to our back uh our techs here claire and maya who are running things uh, behind the scenes and they will help you if you have any technical questions on that um i mean i, I think um to, to keep the conversation going Alfred, i think we find ourselves in in really interesting times now um and you talked about the rise of the right wing um, yeah, it did, didn't it? But I mean, I think it's, it's kind of my hope, um, my sense is that it's kind of peaked and that uh, we haven't talked about COVID or the pandemic at all. And I think that what the pandemic has shown in essence is the real fault lines. Um, people I think are getting, you know, let's talk North America for a minute, both sides of the border, people are getting healthcare. You need health care, you need public health care, you need fully funded health care, you need schools that work, you know, that have ventilation and that, you know, people can go in and out of safely uh, and not be infected. You need long term care that isn't built on profit so that, you know, people die of dehydration. Uh, the fault lines are really showing themselves quite dramatically. And I think for um, for those folk who are on the left, um, you know, that's pretty clear to everybody now. I mean, you can see even in, in the polling just recently, you know, the that Ford's polling is really taking a hammering and it's around those issues, right? Mm. Because everybody relies on those issues. And, you know, even south of the border, people are getting money now. They're getting vaccinations now, you know, people are starting to see even, you know, the Biden has We'd like, you know, we can talk about that another time, but I mean, the Democratic Party and its problems, but I mean, still, it's not Trump, right? So yeah. not Trump equals better. Um, and up here, um, and, and up here, it's the same. And I, I get the very distinct sense that there's a kind of awakening happening. Um, and I just, uh, uh, and yeah, um, so I, 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 
think that there's a very good chance in our own province that we'll have a one a one term government that maybe that's my optimism. I, I, I'm optimistic with you. You know, I, I wanted to comment on on the, the, the notion of the, the rise of the right. And I I, I grew up my family's from from Africa, East Africa, where I was born, and we we lived in England for a number of years. And I grew up in in Vancouver, and Vancouver's uh, BC's politics is also fairly sort of like their left wing is right wing <laughs> of, of a lot of other places uh, in the in 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 the country. Um, but I through this whole rise of Trumpism and and all of this sort of rhetoric and and so on, I I've wondered whether in fact it's a rise or simply a coming out of, uh, of a, uh, a coming out of their closet, um, a closet that people sort of edged themselves into because things were not seen as being popular because they didn't realize how far things were gonna go and they remained silent. And then all of a sudden uh, Trump gets elected and it's almost like a switch has gone, has, has gone on and, and people now have the space and the capacity to, um, for all their ignorance and all their venom and all their um, um, uh, prejudices to to be articulated and to come out. So I'm I'm I don't know how much of it is a is a rise as opposed to a coming out of it. But you cannot, uh, you know, in, in when we talk about light and dark and contrast, you need the dark to see the light, but also you need a stillness to be able to see the light sometimes and to also to be able to experience the dark. And I think that the fault lines that you talked about, uh, for example, Black Lives Matter. I mean, I, I remember when uh, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, stop the the pride parade and the reaction of folks and the things that folks would say uh, to to that whole narrative. And I remember having a conversation with um, uh, with uh, an older older than me uh, white lesbian woman about my thoughts on 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 that. And I said, well, you know, I'm a gay man. I live in the gayborhood, and when women started to say that they felt unrepresented at the dyke march, when women started saying that they needed space, there was all this venom and vitriol and misogyny that came pouring out. You could read it in the pages of Extra and, and, and so on and so forth. And I said, I, I went out and I stood on the sidelines every pride parade, uh, uh, sorry, every, every dyke march. Uh, because I was listening to what people were saying about how they felt, not how I thought they should feel or, mm -hmm. or, or so on. Um, and I said, so I'm, I'm listening to, to black folks. I'm, I'm, I'm racialized. I have my own experience of, of racism. Um, I'm listening to the black folks and to their experience. Um, and I think that the silence, I know a lot of my Sufi siblings um, have gone through this notion of seclusion during this time for periods of time to, to be able to detach and to reflect. And I think that's in the stillness that we're seeing these fault lines. And I, there's a line in your book that I really liked about how we needed to be cracked for the light to come through. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, that's an image that is often found in a, in a, in a lot of theologies and, and so on, that you need to have that form of of, I don't want to say rapture because it has a whole different sort of context, but that, that whole sort of sense of being, br of breaking apart in order to, to see the light and to come back and to come back together. So sure. um, I'm just going to go to the questions now, Elfric. I'm just looking mm -hmm. at, like they're coming in thick and fast now. A lot of congratulations and thank you. Uh, thank you, Merit, uh, for thanking us and thanking me. Rima, of course, uh, says Salam Zelfrug. So good to be here. I'm so excited for this event. Thank you. Um, and uh, congratulations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Peggy Nash has a question. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Peggy. Um, what advice would you give to a young activist who wants to make a difference through politics? What's a good path forward? And uh, I mean, it, I'm in politics because Peggy asked me to lunch. <laughs> so so that's why I'm here and thank you for that. Um, so I, I, I think truly get involved. I, I would say get involved in electoral politics. Absolutely get involved in a political party that matches your aims, even if it doesn't match your aims entirely. I mean, I'm with the NDP because it's our Labour Party, because it represents at its best the rank and fa file of the Labour movement. Um, that's why I'm there. And uh, just like the Labour Party in Great Britain, it does, it takes weird turns sometimes, and sometimes I don't agree with what's done. But I'm, you know, I, I feel I should be there to 
try to change that right so do that but i mean by all means don't limit yourself to that you know there's all sorts of other organizations and causes that you need to be involved in um here's one um Alfred from uh, uh, rash is easy uh, who says i love working with you in building solidarity with iranian progressives and socialists um what do you think international solidarity work has brought to the canadian left um, so maybe we can talk about that for a minute before we go on to the next one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Arash, uh, Arash, I have to tell a funny story about Arash. Arash, uh, a Marxist friend, um, great to have you here. Arash wrote a great book, The Shadow Commander, um, out of New York. You sh everybody should, should buy that book too. Um, but I remember seeing him at a Lieutenant Governor event at Queens Park, this young Marxist, Iranian, and I said, Arash, what are you doing here? Like, how did they let you in? And he said, well, I speak Farsi and Arabic and he worked for an Iranian publication, then went on to work for the BBC. So that's our Arash um, uh, now doing good things in New York. Um, so thanks for coming. So El Farouk, what do you think? The Canadian left in light of the world, especially the Iranian world. Well, that's... Uh... Uh, I... <laughs> I don't know. How do you that's start that conversation? Hour. That's the, the, another hour. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those questions where, like, you know, it's a it's a five word question, but it's a three hour kind of a, a, of a, of a response. And certainly, the I mean, the, the I, I grew up in Vancouver. I was at university in the late seventies. Uh, sorry, in the in the early 80s during the revolution, and there was a whole pouring in of of Iranians, and it was such a you know, you walked into the into the student union building and one day there was 20 people sitting together and like uh, by the end of the week there was 300 people sitting together but then all the religious and political divisions started happening and then that table started sort of fragmenting right so the the notion of a, of a progressive Iranian left and 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 so on and so forth I grew up in Vancouver with a lot of Shahis um, uh, so that's that's a very interesting sort of narrative for for me um, I think that uh, Many. I love traveling, and I've lived in three continents in my in in my lifetime. The first two in the in the first ten years of my life. Um, I think travel really opens up the world. I think Canadians sometimes don't have a um, unless they've traveled or they've been intimately involved. Don't have an understanding of the of the larger world and sort of what goes on there. So, um, for example, Canadians often don't have a sense of. Um, our role in South Africa. And so while we might have been involved in the anti-apartheid movement, and that was important, but the fact that, that you know, apartheid's uh, past laws were based on, on Canadian past laws for indigenous folks is kind of lost in that, in that narrative and that, and that translation. And Tamam in her question sort of speaks about, about white, uh, uh, white supremacy and so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, um, when we talk about the left and we talk about international work and we talk about white supremacy, I mean, I think it's about dislodging where we are as being in the center of the narrative. And again, what the margins are telling us as to what the impacts are on, on, on them. So it's not about what I experience or what you experience, but what the most marginalized are experiencing in, in, in terms of that. And so I think in terms of, of international solidarity work, um, uh, I, I think that a lot of our left wing movements are sort of, first of all, wrapped up in rhetoric and a, a, as opposed to actual uh, on the ground change. And I think that um, one of the benefits, for example, as a flip side, I worked at Queen's Park in political staff, you know, when, when we were and when we had an NDP government all those years ago. Um, and I remember folks coming from South Africa as they were re as they were creating their new constitution and and looking at what we were doing around LGBT issues. And of course, you know, we had some shortcomings as an NDP government provincially around bringing forward some some LGBT stuff at that time. But, you know, th that was that was being informed and also being and, and also informing. And I think that kind of work on on larger systemic issues between the Canadian left and, and international issues, I think, uh, only benefits us in the long term, not just in terms of, of supremacy of white supremacy or challenging that and and doing international solidarity work, but actually bringing um, uh, nuances to our to our socialist agenda, uh, because, you know, people like you and me, we do have a socialist agenda. Right? Sure. So. 
Absolutely, and a queer one too. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Alexa uh, Gilmore, uh, Reverend Alexa from Winderberry, uh, welcome Alexa, it says, Hi, can you Alexa. speak about what you see uh, the role of activist clergy being? And there's another question also in here that I'm just seeing about, you know, uh, right wing um, United Churchers and someone who grew up in a toxic kind of evangelical anti LGBTQ 2SIA. Uh, household um, and 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 Elfric, you must deal with this all the time. I deal with it all the time. I would say, uh, and it's it, it's kind of still shocking to me a little bit because here I'm in this very queer positive church at Trinity St. Paul's that have been affirming for decades, even before the United Church made that brave stand in 1988. And still, you know, still, I you know, people, especially younger people, are come into the church with toxic religious background yeah. um and uh still there are people in the church not necessarily in ours uh but i mean in others that absolutely are not welcoming to queer folk they're they're not um and they're not welcoming to women either some of them mm -hmm. um so so this is a constant uh but you know this reflects i mean churches and and mosques and temples and synagogues reflect the world around them as well. So again, when I talked about um, learning to love people that you don't necessarily like, um, yeah, I mean, that should not be incumbent on on a young person trying to find their way in a faith uh, reality, though. Um, you, you don't want to run the gauntlet. You want to find a place, and you can. I guess the big message is you don't have to stop there. You don't have to be part of a faith community that feels that way. There are alternatives. I mean, there's Unity Mosque. Um, there are a number of synagogues that are queer positive. There are a number of churches that are queer positive. So, um, so find a place that welcomes you. Find a place that welcomes you the way as who you are. Uh, and I think that's so important. And, and to Alexa's question about activist clergy, and then Elfrey can jump in. Um, I mean, I, I again, um, it, yes, just like in politics, it can be tricky. Um, you can be told that your sermons are too political. <laughs> <laughs> you can be told that. Um, yes, that happens. Um, uh, so, uh, so I get it. But again, you know, um, you're a leader and a teacher, right? In 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 ministry leadership, in whatever faith you're in, and um, so. So sometimes people are more amenable to listening to what you have to say after you've, you know, been through a death with them, after you've been through a crisis with them, after you've, um, you've prayed with them many times, and sometimes opinions do shift, uh, and that's been my experience. Elfrid, what about your experience? <laughs> Uh, so hi Alexa. Um, so I, I I think that you know uh, activist clergy is absolutely is absolutely necessary not only because it speaks to our to the truth that we claim to many of us claim to espouse from our from our pulpits, but um, we can only truly be transformed by um, by being frontline and by being in contact and um, seeing what is. Um, where what is hurting people and what is motivating people and what is inspiring people and so again inviting the margins into the center and we can't actually do that from from bastions or insulated spaces i really believe that that, that sort of walking in your in your um, anti-war rallies that's what that's you know doing your climate climate change work and 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 so on um so I, I, I think for myself, my own transformation and my own ongoing journey with my, with my spirituality and my theology is from having been an activist and continuing to be, and you don't necessarily need to do the same things for, for 20 years, and there are changes and progressions in, in, in how we do that, but I think that's abso absolutely vital. Uh, in terms of toxic religious spaces, um, you know, I think that uh, particularly the Christian churches are a little bit more, um, have a little bit of a head start uh, in this conversation uh, than 
a lot of Muslim spaces. So yes, you know, tr Toronto is a lucky space and for, for many kinds of Muslims, we have a number of communities, not just the Unity Mosque, but, but other Muslim spaces that, that are liberal, open, welcoming, uh, affirming, et cetera, for queers, for women, for all kinds of folks. But that's not the universal in the Muslim, in the Muslim context. Um, I know that within the Jewish tradition, uh, that there are also synagogues that are that are uh, queer inclusive and, and and gender inclusive. In the Muslim within the Muslim context, we're still struggling for that. And then in other religious contexts, such as uh, Hindu uh, and Sikh traditions, I, I'm not uh, aware of of active engagement within within those structures, but. Um, it's not always easy to find for for people to find spaces and places, but I think that coming back to this whole issue around COVID, you know, the internet redefined community because then you could now with the internet you could have community, you could be in community with somebody in Indonesia and somebody in Tunisia, uh, and somebody in Toronto, and you could be in community together. And I think what COVID has done is it has changed distance. And so the person who's down the street is as close and as far away as somebody in Singapore and somebody in, uh, in Egypt and somebody in South Africa. And so I think that also allows folks to look for spaces and places that are affirming and that are healing. And they don't need to be satisfied for, with spaces and places where the fullness of their humanity is not embraced or, or, or celebrated. Oh. Um, there's a there's a question here just just jump in um, from Nikki Ashton Nikki so great that you're here uh, you give me so much hope <laughs> um, yeah and, and anyway she's saying you know where's your inspiration what keeps you going well um, let's put it this way there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of support out there um, and there was when I was in political office and there is for you too so um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I say in my book, which is so true about political office, is that everything seems so enormous when it happens to you, or you know, uh, and and it and it is, of course. But then it's yesterday's news within twenty four hours or forty eight. So, like, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you keep on going. And anybody who's been in politics for any length of time knows that that's the case. Um, Norm De Pasquale here again. Um, thank you, Norm, for your work uh, in the Catholic District School Board. Um, uh, just uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, pride flags are flying. Um, and uh, he says, how can the Christian left uh, organize, get organized enough to counter the Christian right? Well, here's, here's a thing I'll say about, the, about Christianity, especially in the States. Every time I've gone to the States, especially as a, a politician, I was there pretty frequently, um, I would find a church that did two things. Uh, and in the day it was anti-Iraq war, uh, anti-war generally, and to pro-equal uh, marriage. Those two things, I'd look for that on their website, wherever I, and then I would go there. I never ever was in a city where I did not find a church that did that. Um, even in the deep south, even in Charleston and places in Florida and Mississippi, I found a church. And the churches were thriving too. They were big. They just don't get the news. You, you got to recognize that the evangelical right in the states, and there's probably Elfrey could talk about maybe there's a, a Muslim, you know, uh, correlative to this. But but I mean, they get the news. They own the newspapers. They own the political power. They got smart back a, you know a couple of you know decades ago, and they got involved in politics in a big way. So they usurped. The, the time, the media time. Um, but it, trust me, there's a huge Christian left in the United States. Um, there's actually an organization called the Christian Left. And, um, and there is in Canada too. And I think we just have to give them more, more air, more space, more time. And, uh, I, and I honestly think that most people, um, yeah, uh, they're, they're, we saw the results from the last election there. I mean, you know, uh, whatever you think again of the Democratic Party, uh, I mean, there was a shift um, when they saw what they were up against with Trump, and I think that's a good thing. Elfrid, what's happening? Is there is there something you know in in your world that that is similar? I know you've spoken about the the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Muslim context in North America is is a little bit different, you know, also because we're looking at at uh, the majority of Muslims in North America or in Western Europe being immigrant or of immigrant descent. 
Uh, and in, in the United States, you also have a large African American Muslim population that has been that has been Muslim for a very, very long time. But there's also been a racial and an economic and a social divide between um, African American Muslims and immigrant Muslims in the in the United States and immigrant Muslims until the last X many number of years have tended to be Republican and socially con and socially and economically conservative, whereas African American Muslims have tended to be uh, uh, have tended to vote uh, Democrat. Now. I, from what I observe, I see there's a shift happening in immigrant uh, origin Muslims and a, further, uh, a greater engagement. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, there, are, there are some amazing racialized women within, within the Democratic Party who are inspiring all of us as to, what it, that, as to how revolution is actually possible, uh, even within the Democratic Party of which, you know, I mean, my, 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 my thoughts about, about party systems and, and party allegiance means that uh, is, is a little bit sort of um, limiting in terms of, of, of full change being possible. And that's why, uh, you know, I, I've sort of uh, opted to, to cast my, my energy at this point in time, and that might change, uh, but to cast my energies right now on, on theology and opening up um, sacred space um, and universalizing sacred space. Uh, because I think that that's the foundation for how we then transform the economics and, and all other aspects. But the Muslim I, I, community, I yeah. think, struggles struggles with um, the issues around being immigrant, being racialized, economic and social issues, and so on and so forth. Um, and how we move and how we integrate older identities and cultures within within the North American context. Yeah. So I think we've got a few more things to to sort of work through before we get to the place of of owning newspapers or or, or so on and so forth. The <laughs> the ones who own the newspapers are are often uh, governments in other parts of the world that mm -hmm. don't actually have our best interest or even our vision of Islam uh, mm -hmm. as as their their focal point, right? Yeah. I just I, I wanted to pick up on something to get back to the book a bit um, uh, that you were talking about. And in the book, I highlight women um, who've really stood out for me and been mentors. I mean, there are many women, many of them are here who are mentioned there. And uh, uh, and, I, and I think uh, and not just women in the NDP, um, people of principle. I mean, I, I say, you know, nobody wants a one party state, right? Mm -hmm. I hope. <laughs> um, so if we don't want a one party state, then we're going to be talking about political difference and we're going to be talking about political debate, etc. cetera. Um, and to me, it's the women who stand up against and over against uh, based on principle, even if I you know, in the particular instances I cite, I have to agree with their principles, but, but, you know, even if I don't, like, it's so refreshing to see somebody say no. Um, uh, you realize that in the political world, you're giving up so much when you do that. If you sit as an independent, if you go up against leadership in any way, shape or form, it's the end of your political career. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the reality. Got it. Um, so, but I mean, I, but there are those individuals and I've seen them and I highlight their actions. And I, to, to your point about, you know, who do you support? Well, I support those women <laughs> who do that, right? Um, and, uh, and and the book kind of highlights them. So I guess we're we're getting just a, a couple of minutes here. I mean, there, there's so many questions. Um, uh, just uh, one thing, a shout out to Fran Coughlin and to one of the th things I also say in the book that is, uh, you know, one of my regrets is not being able to, the, my staff who are here and shout outs to Carly and others um, who are here and Lisa um, who worked with me and of course Butilla who's now, you know, doing this wonderful job as MPP. Um, but one of my regrets when they called me the critter critic was animal issues. You know, I got nowhere with any of my animal issues, even though I, I fought for them over the years. Um, and, um, and, you know, animals are still property in this province um, and you don't need a license to have a tiger or a whale, you know, it's ridiculous. So, uh, uh, but even trying to get Quebec law in here was difficult. So, so again, I, I leave that to those who are now in the in government um, to pick up that mantle and to keep on fighting. And I'm here to fight with you. Um, we're, we're just about at the time. Oh, I just seeing if there's anything. 
anything here. Oh, uh, here's a good question. Of inter interfaith conditions in, uh, in activism. How can we move forward on interfaith coalitions? So that's a, an interesting one for us. I mean, we've done a pretty good job of it, Alfred. I think so. I, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I really do think that 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 a lot is possible and has been possible in Toronto. That's not possible in other places, just simply because we are such a a diverse uh, uh, city. Um, Ten percent of the city is 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 Muslim, and certainly when when I came to be part of that vigil at at your church back in 2002 and there was a representative from the from the mosque in your neighborhood um, and I remember that whole dance that happened and the suspicion that which uh, with which they looked at me and nobody sort of said hello to me until after I spoke and then they all came because I made them look good go figure right <laughs> um, and so you know that has become actually a, a little bit part of my my subversive strategy which is building interfaith relationships with with um, other religious communities that share values. We may not always exactly. share a faith belief, but we share values. So like the United Church is a church where I share values around human rights and, 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 and so on and so forth. But by also then coming into conversation with those spaces and those places, my uh, it shifts the narrative in the large, it hopefully will shift the narrative in the larger Muslim community because we have a, because these Muslim communities, like mine, then are having relationship with larger with larger Canadian society. So there's also this 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 interfaith work is can also be subversive in terms of bringing forward the issues around uh, around gender, around sexuality, around even climate change and animal stuff. In Absolutely. Muslim communities, the climate stuff I don't think is you know there's a whole narrative around stewardship. It hasn't yeah. extended into animal, though there is uh, increasing conversations on what constitutes um, work to do, Alfred, and so on. But lots yeah, of work, work to do, to do right? and it'll but be the, good work. So but thank the you. Interfaith, yeah. interfaith work is really, really important. I think Absolutely. to the to the future. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, you're looking like you want to jump in here. <laughs> no, you caught me out slightly because you seemed like you were taking a break, and then the conversation came up again. Yeah. Which no, just it could go on forever, forever, and it will. <laughs> yeah, which just, just points towards how generative this has been and how lovely and inspiring to listen to both of you uh, talk about your experiences. Um, I want to thank you both for taking the time and, and to being so forthcoming and, and so honest and, and open about uh, your experiences of, regarding the intersections between faith, politics, activism, and hope as we look back on your memoir, Sherry, which is the reason we're here, but also as we look forward to driving further social change. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. I would like to remind everyone that copies of Sherry's book, The Queer Evangelist, are available from another story in Toronto. Again, I'll remind everyone of the link in the in the chat, and there are signed copies there, so that's uh, a, an added bonus. And, and a, a small shout out uh, to uh, independent bookstores everywhere if you're, if you're not in, based in Toronto and looking to order. So thank you everyone. Uh, good night, stay well, read many books. Bye everybody.